All right. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Today, we have a, a special guest. His name is David Van Dusen, I believe it's pronounced. And uh, David's been around a really long time in the anarchist uh, community as and going all the way back to uh, NEFAC times. Um, he was with a project called uh, Green Mountain Anarchist Collective. Correct. And uh, we'll be getting into all sorts of stuff about that. And currently, David is the president of the AFL-CIO in Vermont, which is also incredibly interesting. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned, and we will be covering a lot here. So, uh, David, are, so are you still in Vermont, I'd imagine? I am. I'm based up here in uh, the northeast section of the state, right on the border of a place called we, the Northeast Kingdom. And uh, I've read some of your writing about the history of the counterculture in Vermont. And I definitely would like to start off just having you explain what it is that makes Vermont so much different. I mean, Bernie Sanders is from there. Uh, Book Chin is from there. So... There's a lot that's been going on over the years, and I'd like to hear about it. Sure. Well, if you just looked at the demographics, you know, Vermont is overwhelmingly rural. We are sparsely populated. We are mountainous, wooded. Uh, 80, 85 percent, 85 percent of the state is wooded. Um, there isn't a place that doesn't have mountains, uh, either in the smack dab in the middle or in sight. We're an aging population. We're not diverse by uh, traditional American standards. And on paper, frankly, we should be the most right-wing Republican state in the entire country. That's what we are demographically. But Vermont is debatably the most progressive place in the United States of America, or one of the most progressive. So how did we get there? You asked about the counterculture. And the late 1960s, the population of the state was about 350,000 people. Now we're at about 600,000. At that time, leaving the conflict of the cities, leaving behind uh, an increasingly post-industrial uh, urban centers, an estimated 100,000 counterculture youth came to Vermont. Dozens and dozens of communes were started back then. And it wasn't just that people were bringing their politics and their counterculture to this rural state. They were also greatly, those that stayed, impacted by a very old rural tradition up here, which values direct participatory democracy. So a generation later, and I'm skipping many things for a moment, but just yeah. to get to where we're at. A generation later, those politics, those of the counterculture and those of the traditional Vermont town meeting um, ways of being become what we have now, which is a relatively libertarian in some regards, uh, but a very progressive uh, place to live, place to be, a place to organize. So back in the 60s, late 60s and early 70s, up until uh, maybe the mid-1970s, the commune movement was very robust. Uh, there was an organization uh, called Free Vermont, which was a radical left federation of various communes all throughout the state. And they were uh, really started, or the main organizers came out of something called, uh, I think it was the Red Clover collective, if I recall right. But those folks that originally came from New York City, which were part of the Newsreel collective. So we're talking John Douglas, Roz Payne, uh, the Kramers, a number of other folks. And uh, they sought to politicize the counterculture. Uh, they were not uh, timid of being armed either, as you point out. Mm -hmm. They provided uh, material support, uh, places to hide for Weather Underground and uh, the Black Panther Party. Uh, one historic note is that it said 
that the first dynamite that the Weather Underground got their hands out of came from a granite quarry here in Barrie. Yeah. But their projects, their projects uh, were seeking to transform and, and build on the old democratic traditions of the state mixed with the new left uh, ideals. So things like co-ops, uh, consumer co-ops, uh, in some cases, uh, worker co-ops, and um, farmers markets, right? These were projects of uh, the free Vermont and the commune movement. And now you cannot throw a stone, you know, 50 years later, you can't throw a stone in the state of Vermont and not hit a farmer's market. You can't be in a town or a city of any size without there being a major uh, food cooperative there. The Women's Health Clinic uh, in Burlington, the Free Clinic, what is now the Free Clinic in Burlington, was a project of commune movements. You can't look at the basic institutions of this state and not draw a direct line to what came out of the counterculture movement of the late 60s and early 70s. Bernie Sanders himself uh, comes out of something called the Liberty Union Party, which is a socialist party that somewhat still exists up here. But that really grew out of the commune movement as well. And he was chairman of that party before he became mayor of Burlington. So yeah, he, yeah, I saw you. And you were writing about him, you know, long before any of his runs for president or I probably even before the Senate, right? Oh, certainly. I mean, Bernie um, has been a strong supporter of the labor movement up here long before he became mayor in 1980 or 1981 of, of Burlington. And while he was mayor of Burlington, he had a very good, strong relationship with the unions there. So there's not a union up here that's had a strike that hasn't marched or walked shoulder to shoulder with Bernie Sanders, who's come down to support him. So when we look at Bernie running for president in the United States of America, he is twice now, he was speaking about issues that he's been speaking about here since the early 1970s. Yeah. He has not uh, radically changed his message when he's talking about social revolution or political revolution. Now that's what he was talking about back in the day as well. So we know Bernie. Well, he's not just a figure you see on CNN or, or television. He's somebody that we personally know. Many of us have had dinner with him on occasion, uh, you know, for one of his campaigns for Senate, he provided free spaghetti dinners all around the state. And that was his campaign. And people would come out, they'd eat spaghetti with red sauce with them, and they talk politics. And, you know, lo and behold, he, he won in a landslide. So, so Bernie Sanders comes out of the counterculture, but so does the Vermont Progressive Party. We have a third party up here, uh, which is essentially a democratic socialist party that uh, until recently had the lieutenant governor spot. Uh, and also has, has currently the auditor uh, position, which is statewide office, and has 10 or so folks elected to the state Senate and the uh, state, uh, the House of Representatives. And, and that's uh, something that was founded by Bernie Sanders in the 19, you know, it, it started off as a coalition in Burlington while he was mayor in the 80s. So in a sense, once removed, you could trace that back to the uh, radical political counterculture movement of uh, the early 70s as well. Yeah, it's really, um, just while we're on the topic of Bernie Sanders, uh, one of the bills that he proposed that I I think is pretty radical is he had something um, about creating a, a bank that would be an investment bank for co-ops and for workers that wanted to uh, buy the firm as a first option uh, if uh, a business was leaving, do they have something like that already there in Vermont? Uh, unfortunately, no. There has been a push for a number of years for, for us to start a state bank. There is a state bank in, in one of the Dakotas there uh, to better invest our money in community projects like that. We do have a worker ownership center that helps steer uh, workers uh, provide resources, direct them to resources to help start worker co-ops up here, or in some cases, ESOPs. Of course, the worker co-op model, which is much more democratic, is, in my opinion, much more desirable. Uh, so we don't have that resource yet. Uh, there is an election this year for a new state treasurer. The outgoing state treasurer is retiring, opposed the state bank proposal. 
So there may be room for us to re-engage in that conversation in the coming years, which I hope we do. I think that is something that's vastly important. And the idea that taxpayer money would go to uh, be put in private banks to be invested for the benefit of capital, as opposed to the workers, to propose to the regular people who, who the ones who paid into that money, is absurd to me. It's a borderline crime. So uh, I'm hopeful about the future on that, but but we're not there yet. But we do have a good amount of uh, worker co-ops, some new, some old, uh, some known, maybe some less known. King Arthur Flour, which produces a, a huge quantity of uh, flour for cooking each year, is 100% worker-owned. Karis Reels is another large company that's worker-owned. We just unionized, and this might sound odd to you, uh, through AFSCME Local 1369, uh, a worker co-op uh, who's now a dues-paying union member as part of the labor movement that produce, uh, called Rabble Rouser, that produce chocolate and granola. Mm -hmm. So uh, we also not only want to, I think I, I'm seeking for the labor movement and for those within the political movements in Vermont, we don't want to just create different silos. We want to find ways to break down silos, right, and build a stronger united movement, labor movement that could try to advance the notions of workplace democracy, advance the notion of uh, uh, union members coming together to advocate for social and political change. Uh, but we don't do that in silos. We do that united. Yeah. And that's that's a huge task. I mean, I, I you know, in Arizona where I'm at, I'm, union membership is pretty difficult to come by. I know I've never had a union job uh, and just most people seem, well, maybe now is different with Starbucks, but people seem to think that because it's a right to work state that you can't even have a union, which I thought for a long time, and it's not true. But it is incredibly difficult to start going on that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on the, um, what did you, you said the workers come, um, center or something you were talking about that provides well, resources well uh there's uh, well there is a, a worker ownership center uh based in burlington that tries to help facilitate uh, the formation of worker co-ops and esops and things along those lines um but uh, is is that what you're yeah that's what i was talking about <clears throat> do you know if there's a lot of things like that around the country you no, know, I, I couldn't. I honestly couldn't tell you. I mean, 95% uh, of the work that I do uh, these days and for the last bunch of years has been centered very squarely in Vermont. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm under no illusion that, that there's such thing as where you have uh, some sort of social revolution in one state. Right. That's not going to happen. <laughs> right. But at the same token, um, I think there's also a danger to uh, spending too much uh, time fixated on national or international issues. Because I believe very strongly the place where regular folks and working people could have the most impact is where they live, right? And if we're gonna change the world, if we're gonna uh, seek to challenge the entrenched powers of capitalism, uh, we need to be able to break the chains at many lengths. And to do that, you have to be strong in your local area and you have to be strong in your community, in your, your city, in your state. And so most of my work is is very strictly based in Vermont, not exclusively, but for the most part. Yeah, and I, I actually, uh, in the same way, I tend to focus mostly on Tempe and then a little bit more uh, generally on Arizona. But uh, yeah, I, I agree with you on all of those points. And just from experience, it's really the things that are done at the local level that seem to have an impact. Mm -hmm. Um so yeah, uh, and mostly when I say that, I mean neighborhood organizing here, just because the lack of co-ops, although there are plenty, and um, the lack of unions. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the other big topics that you're well known for and that you've done an extensive amount of research and writing about is the black block. And uh, you know, today uh, with Antifa, it, it's hard to say. I think it's difficult for most people to differentiate between what the Black Bloc was and what Antifa 
does now. And mm -hmm. so I want to uh, discuss the black block a little to give people a reminder of why it formed and how it got, how various black blocks got to the size they did of being thousands of people and uh, what the role was and try to contrast that a little bit with Antifa. And also may talk about ARA a little bit too. Sure, I used to be a member of ARA, Columbus ARA for a period of time. Um, so most of your viewers will probably be aware at least of some of the history, but of course the black bloc as a tag that comes out of Germany hmm. in the you know, late seventies, early eighties, uh, first makes an appearance in the United States to my recollection starts to around 1988. So when it becomes something that most people know as, as a thing, comes out of Seattle, right? People right. saw uh, what happened in Seattle. They saw a black bloc roaming downtown, attacking capitalist uh, targets, uh, physical targets uh, during uh, the trade, the WTO meetings that were going on at the time. So uh, my first about black bloc that I marched in was in 1996 in Chicago against the Democratic National Convention. Uh, it's one where Bill Clinton was ultimately nominated, if I recall, for a second term for president. And uh, the way that I got interested or uh, self-educated on it, I recall going to one march and I wasn't masked up for immigrant rights. And uh, it was pretty tense. Uh, it ultimately was not violent, but it was pretty tense. And at the end of it, we end up getting the whole march of several thousand people, but a bunch of uh, us kind of inadvertently got stuck in this kind of very confined area, right? Ugh, yeah. And and the police were, uh, riot police were kind of, um, I think, a uh, long time ago, but I think that they played a role in, in how it ended up where it ended up. And I was up on... Um, something raised i recall with a few other comrades and most folks were masked um, a lot of folks were masked at this march but not me and then the lines of riot police i saw one of the cops i had words with earlier tapping his buddies in the shoulder and they were pointing at me with a nightstick and they were making it really clear right that when the order came i was going to pay a price yeah. so it was that exact moment actually where oh i get it now Right. This is why you mask up. This is why sometimes being anonymous is to your collect your interest, your self interest, but to the collective self interest as well. Uh, a day or two later, I marched in uh, another action, and that was the first time I was max masked up. Right, and there was hundreds of people masked up. So for a period of years, uh, I engaged in that. You know, millions from Umia, um, the mm -hmm. F anti-FTA protests in Quebec City, uh, you know, m many different actions. Uh, and just numbers wise, uh, you know, I know anyone younger than me pretty much is not going to understand exactly what that time period was like uh, from 1999 in Seattle onward until the anti-war movement. So, um, yeah, I mean, there these were not small protests. No. No, there would be, I mean, every protest, every demonstration was different, but um, they grew. Keep in mind from 1996 forward, um, really until you get uh, into the, up until at least the 9-11, 9-11 happens, they were on a growth period. Yeah. In some regards, you could, you could argue that they're exponentially growing in some cases, right? So there would be a large contingent of people, in some cases, tens of thousands who were not masked up. And then uh, in one of the inauguration protests, I recall the, the black bloc was a thousand, you know, out of, let's say tens of thousands, but a thousand is a huge right. number. Um, I don't think I'd be exaggerating to say that there, in that period of time, uh, there may have been a couple actions that might've hit, you know, 1,000, 2,000 people in a black bloc. So uh, that was big. That wasn't a small thing. Now, it wasn't just big actions, though. Uh, there were also smaller actions. Usually those would be anti-fascist actions. 
uh, that could involve dozens of people or hundreds as opposed to a thousand. And those had a, a different vibe to them. Those, and at times back then, we would refer to ourselves as Antifa at times in communications and what have you. I don't know that it had the life that it does now. You know, it's kind of grown into a, a, its own beast of sorts. Yeah. At that, it but, seemed, yeah. from my memory, it seems that before, you know, I don't know how long it's been now, 10 years or so. Anti, if you said Antifa, it was sort of like, uh, you were referring usually to something in Europe. And if you were talking about here, usually you were going to be talking about ARA. Yes. Well, it's funny you said, because I, I remember one of the, the communiques we put out after an action in Lewis to Maine, where we laid siege to an armory where um, a bunch of white power and Nazi organizations were meeting. Uh, the communique we put out, and there was largely an ARA uh, slash NEFAC driven event, uh, or organized event. Uh, we put out the, the community in such a way where it was the, something or another Antifa, right? But that was coming out of the ARA culture at that time, which was borrowing from some of the European um, terminologies and, and what have you. And then I think about the uh, three or various actions in York, Pennsylvania, again, where, where this time ARA, uh, including my chapter, uh, Columbus, you know, managed to beat the shit out of a bunch of Nazis out there and shut down their organizing. And and at that time, for those type of actions with ARA, uh, it would be fairly common to, to use the words Black Bloc and Antifa intermix. Hmm. Interesting. And one so when I was reading one of your pieces and I, you know, I crammed for the for this occasion, but um, you mentioned something about uh, trying to influence the um the capacity for black blocks to organize and some of the coordination and um just i guess uh logistics for organizing and uh i thought that was really interesting and at least for protests and whatnot that i've been to over the past few years the coordination seems to be pretty shit and well, yeah, uh, but that, but that, that's where the that pamphlet, communicating tactics, it comes out of that same situation, right? So myself and uh, members that would go, people that would go on to be part of the Green Mountain Anarchist Collective, um, and to a certain extent, Columbus Anti-Racist Action, who worked with us on a second edition of that pamphlet. Uh, we, we were at tons of different uh, black block type of actions. And inevitably, there'd be some part, some crucial moment where you'd be arguing in an intersection with 200 people about to go right or left, while riot <laughs> police were mobilizing behind you, right, to try to cut you off and, and do a tactical move. So that was dangerous. That's not just like bad protest tactics. That, that becomes physically dangerous. So uh, the Green Mountain Anarchist Collective we thought that there was a, a real need to try to better refine the tactics and best practices of black block actions. And so we put out that pamphlet, uh, I want to say in late 2000. So, you know, 22 years ago and widely circulated it a publisher out of Montreal. Uh, you know, this is before the internet was as widely used as it is today, uh, published uh, a version of it that went to info shops around the country. And uh, Columbus ARA reached out to us, and this is how I ultimately ended up joining Columbus ARA for a period of time. They reached out to us and said, look, we find it really interesting. Uh, we have some ideas about certain things you write about that we think we can be made better. Can we have a meeting? So myself and Xavier Masseau, who was a founding member of uh, Green Mountain Anarchist Collective, went to Columbus, met with uh, such folks as uh, oh, Jerry and Andy and uh, a person uh, some folks may know going went by the name of Lady and a bunch of other folks. And we spent a couple days really talking about a vision for how to make this better. And over a period of time, we produced the second edition, is which is the one that most people probably have read, uh, and produced another pamphlet. And that was widely circulated and debated in the anarchist uh, movement. There were those who felt that our organization structure 
uh, got away too far away from some pure idea of anarchism, right? They thought that if you elect somebody who can make tactical decisions or have any sort of structure, then it's magically turns into Leninism, right? Right. Our, our argument was, no, that's bullshit. I mean, why is it that when the CNT and FAI elect their own officers in the Spanish Civil War, or for that matter, in the Ukraine under Makhno, and are empowered to make um, tactical decisions, why is that? held up as an example of anarchist struggle. But when we try here domestically to give some structure to make ourselves more impactful to actually be able to win, why is that somehow against whatever quasi-religious view, right, that cultural anarchists may have? So that's a debate I'm happy to have all day long because I think I'm right about it. But that, you know, that was a debate at the time. And then there were groups uh, largely with the NEFAC, like Barracotta Collective and different chapters that were pretty well organized from ARA who agreed with us, where a lot of the more loosely affiliated, uh, you know, um, temporary affinity groups or individuals, cultural anarchists, were the ones who tended to take somewhat of issues. Yeah, it seems like that debate, fortunately, in my opinion, is starting to disappear. Uh, I think, you know, the tyranny of structurelessness, that essay has made its rounds and mm -hmm. just the changing of uh, people that are even involved in things, their, their attitudes are different. So, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that the spontane spontaneity versus more formal is, debate is starting to die down a little bit. Mm -hmm. But it was big at the time. And when people said spontaneous... <laughs> And when that was what they're for, they really, I mean, they basically meant chaotic and really not. Well, it's dangerous. I mean, you don't go into a situation, if you look at those kind of actions, that rely 100% on mobility. And if you're not able to make quick decisions and, in fact, be mobile, all you're going to do is get penned in. And you're, you're always going to be at the disadvantage to the state when it comes to straight up resources and muscle. So. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't dig the notion of a suicide mission. You know, I, I didn't then and I don't now. Um, so, so anyway, that's, that's the way I look at those, those type of things. Yeah, well, I'll definitely, do you know if that, um, the, uh, if that text is online anywhere? I guarantee it is. Uh, I couldn't tell you. The Anarchist Library, I believe what has it up there. I'll try to hunt it down and put it in the notes for this episode. Sure. I think it's pretty important. Um, the other big thing, you know, while we're talking about the past is NEFAC. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to talk to you both about the Green Mountain Anarchist Collective, but also try to try to get a bit of an understanding of what NEFAC was doing in the area and how they came out of love and rage and what succeeded them as the Black Rose Collective, which is also no longer around, uh, as far as I know. Um, so I guess let's start off with just, uh, you talked about what the situation was like when uh, people who would later be Green Mountain Anarchist Collective um, members uh, what that situation was like, but we didn't really get to hear much about what the collective was like. Sure. Well, I can give you some genesis, right? So from the, speaking personally, from the mid nineties forward, uh, I was increasingly involved with left-wing politics, uh, identify myself as, as an anarchist. And uh, was really inspired and excited with the counter convention, which I referenced before in Chicago in 1996. The, and that was um, dozens and dozens of workshops in a warehouse that was ultimately raided, go figure, by the police. But it all was culminating in, in protests against uh, what we would later come to call neoliberalism and against the Democratic Party. Um, so if you fast forward to 1999, November, uh, when Seattle takes place, I was, uh, I just got done working on a farm for a season up here in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont, sold my old eat up Subaru and uh, with maybe 800 bucks in my pocket, I moved to Spain, specifically the city of Seville. And while I was living there, 
that's when Seattle erupted. I remember being on the farm uh, that summer and on the farm, somehow uh, a flyer showed up to protest in Seattle. And it should have dawned on me then that if a random flyer about Seattle shows up in this tiny little poor farm, you know, in the northeastern corner of Vermont, it should have tipped me off that something major was happening, but it didn't register. I've seen so many calls to action right up until that point in my life that it just seemed like, oh, it's probably just another thing. Yeah. But when Seattle did break and the black block was instrumental in disrupting the flow of that city in the, the, the WTO meetings themselves, I think they played a hugely important role along with organized labor for the mass march and, and the other groups that were there to protest. But when that happened, it was a huge deal in the city of Seville in Spain. You know, the local socialist party had meetings, you know, and I, I went to one with my very limited Spanish and did my best to try to understand to it. For them, they wanted to talk about and explain the significance of what was going on in the heart of capitalism in the mm -hmm. United States and what that resistance meant to the rest of the movement. Um, I mean, Jesus, it was front page news. Right across the ocean in another continent in another country. So that said to me, holy shit, there's something going on here. And there was something going on. So when I come back to the United States uh, towards the end of that winter, so now we're into 2000, I sat down with a few uh, close comrades of mine and, and we talked to them and we said, look, now's the time. Let's start an anarchist collective. Let's get involved with politics. Initially, our interest was in uh, building support for and taking part in these militant black bloc actions. Right. And that is not, I got to clarify for folks that maybe don't know me better, you know, that was not driven out of some sort of notion of uh, violence. That was driven out of this very serious feeling that we had to show resistance to an economic and social system that was uh, actually killing people, right? It was busting unions, destroying fucking livelihoods hurting human beings, and we felt we had to show resistance. It was a generational thing that we had to do. Hmm. And we had momentum with us. Uh, we had the wind at our sails after Seattle, and there was a huge in interest in anarchism, and there was a huge interest in, well, what does radical democracy look like? What does it mean, right? Let's talk about it. Let's try to practice it, but let's also uh, try to realize that on a bigger scale. NEFAC starts coming together around that time. Uh, and NEFAC, Northeastern Federation Anarcho Communists, was across border, meaning in um, Quebec, later Ontario, and uh, New England, and then later, I think, dipping all the way down to close to DC. Uh, organization for the Northeast that sought to coordinate uh, radical uh, democratic advocacy and pro worker um, sentiment and to organize towards that better world that we want to see. And initially, uh, NEFAC, like the Green Mountain Anarchist Collective, put a heavy influence, or uh, uh, heavy focus on militant black bloc type organizing as part of larger mass mobilizations. I think that's important to get across too. I was surprised when I read that mm -hmm. uh, because I'm more familiar with them later. But... Yes, like, so in fact, back then, to my memory, the only time where you would have black bloc type actions that were divorced from a, a mass mobilization were if they were very specific against Nazis. Yep. You know, there was some noteworthy battles, all of which were won by the good guys at Valley Forge. I recall one being a couple at York, you know, Lewiston, Maine, and, and one in D.C., I recall. But those could be smaller and different and black bloc only. Right. But generally speaking, these were smaller contingents supporting a mass movement. So the West Coast uh, often felt like uh, the focus was on uh, symbolic or some sort of property uh, destruction of some kind against some banks, against capital. Not that that didn't happen in the East Coast. It certainly did. But on the East Coast, the focus tended to be um, protecting protesters in many cases against crazy police. Yes. So it, what was it called? At A16, which was a uh, protest in Washington, D.C., the first big ones after Seattle, uh, this, these were in Washington, D.C. Uh, they were real, they were large, they, they were, uh, the protests were growing, they were militant. Uh, I was part of the Black Bloc in that action as well. There was a, a moment, 
that was crucial where a bunch of uh, hippies, for lack of a better term, right, were like, I don't know, sitting in some street, walking some street, doing doing whatever they do, right? That's never been my thing either, right? To each their own, though. It takes many to make a movement. But they're doing this peacefully, you know, uh, pacifist all the way, other than not letting cars and shit go through. They, they, they were doing nothing. Police pull up in a, a van, uh, not a van, it was a school bus. They, they come out in full ride gear and just start beating the shit out of these fucking hippies. Just beating the shit out of them. You know, belly clubs on the head and all this. So uh, at that time, that's when the black black block came up and we charged and had a counterattack and physically fought them off. Right. So that's the type of thing that was often happening. Um, it wasn't devoid of things like uh, property destruction, too, but the focus tended to be on that kind of militant self-defense. Yeah. And that seems to I think to me, that's what the difference is between black block and what Antifa seems to do is this orientation towards the police line versus uh, orientating towards wherever the fascists are. Mm -hmm. Not that either one's better or worse, but I think it's an important difference because it calls for very different um, techniques. They are different, but I mean, there there isn't a clear moment where where something's all one way or all the other, right? Sure. Like, so I just gave you the example, and I thought it was a great example. And later on, after I, I had my black black gear off, I remember just standing around in front of some church or somewhere. There was a bunch of folks conglomerating after the action in D.C. and hearing nothing but people singing the praises of the black bloc. How you know we saved their ass, right? And it, it was just it was it was a good thing, and it made the overall action more effective because those nonviolent uh, disrupting of commerce were able to happen without people's heads getting smashed and then being dragged away. And then 30 minutes later, the traffic flowing, right? So they were complementing each other. But, you know, uh, if you also think about what happened in uh, Quebec City the next year, uh, I think it was against the FTAA, uh, that was a very successful action too. And it was a mass demonstration. I mean, I want to say there were 70,000 people out in the streets at one point or something like this, a sizable black block on, on different days. But, you know, there was, uh, you know, bank, a couple banks were torched, you know, and things like that. Security perimeter defenses were ripped down. So it's all not one or the other. And, and, and in between these mass mobilizations, there was also these more narrow, small anti-fascist actions, which were exclusively aimed at um, physically beating fascists to the point where they wouldn't try to organize in that town again. And that was largely effective as well, but for different reasons, right? And in a different right. context, uh, I see that as more of a defensive action uh, in some regards to, to make the streets, make the community safe for leftists to organize in against the larger right institutional problems. So I say all this to get to the point where NEFAC and, and the stuff we were involved with and ultimately the stuff that the Green Mountain Anarchist Collective was involved with, Somewhere around 2002, was it? No, before that. Somewhere before 9-11. Okay, so we're talking 2001, probably late 2001. There was a NEFAC uh, conference and a strategic decision was made democratically that the organization would put less of a focus on black lock organizing and more of a focus on community and labor organizing. Mm -hmm. uh, our collective voted against that. Uh, we thought that the reason why we were in a growth stage of new collectives being formed and we were getting militant uh, young folks uh, involved more and more was because the energy that was being generated by that type of militant activity. We thought it was an error to forsake one to try to uh, make gains somewhere else. And we also thought that we could do both. But we lost that vote, our collective, and we respected the decision of the organization, right? And the organization increasingly turn to more community-based organizing, which is hugely important. I'm not trying to diminish that in any way, shape, or form. And, and frankly, our collective also became much more engaged in real grassroots community organizing, which in many ways is, is much harder and, and you know much more challenging than these one-off militant things. So one of the things we were involved with for a period of years was working, uh, our collective, working with the Vermont Workers Center and the United Electrical Workers to try to create a union of uh, retail 
and service workers in our capital city of Montpelier. And, and that was for several years, a major focus of ours. We won contracts, helped win contracts in a couple different shops. At one point we had one third of the city workforce uh, who worked in those sectors sign union cards. We implemented a citywide grievance procedure, even in shops that did not have union contracts. We would have our own way of trying to enforce through pressure tactics, uh, resolutions on the job. And we had about a 70% success rate when we targeted business with a grievance. Um, so that was a major focus. And I think that was important. And there was a lot of lessons to be learned there. Ultimately, by 2005, uh, that project did not uh, succeed, right? We had many successes and we learned many lessons. But as far as the long haul goes, that was not successful uh, in that uh, in, our, uh, in that attempt. Hmm. That's the kind of stuff we got engaged with, as well as supporting dairy farmers in their struggle to make uh, a livable wage for a hundred pound of milk, which they still struggle with today. And we made, um, you know, alliance. Uh, we worked with a group called Dairy Farmers Vermont towards that. We also sought to highlight the struggle of the Abenaki, you know, which is the Native American First Nations people in Vermont. And, and we're generally uh, engaged in labor support, union support, and labor actions in Vermont. And that's something I carry with me as president of the Vermont AFL-CIO to this day. Well, let me ask you something more about that. So uh, what's what's the deal, I guess, with the Wobblies or the IWW in, in your area that um, you wound up doing a lot of this with your more well-known labor unions than... Uh, the IWW. We do have an IWW chapter uh, up in Burlington. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting story about it. the other day on May Day. In fact, a couple days ago. Yeah, Happy May Day. <laughs> Thank you. You too. A couple days ago, uh, as president of the AFL CIO in Vermont, I was up with a few other uh, union comrades walking on a picket line in support of migrant farm workers. Right. And we're targeting Hannaford's and demanding that all across New England, major supermarket chain, demanding that they only source their dairy products from farms that sign up to the Milk with Dignity campaign, which were, would guarantee fair pay and safe and good working conditions for farm workers, regardless of their immigration status. And Migrant Justice is a group that organized that and we're firm allies with them. Absolutely. Uh, to the hill. So I was up there, I rode my motorcycle up there, and at the end of the march to get to the picket, I pulled into the parking lot of Hannaford's with my motorcycle with a Milk with Dignity sign in the front on the handlebars. Security came, and uh, a bunch of security, and uh, a manager for the store, and, and a cop and what have you came over. Uh, and informed me that I wasn't allowed to park my motorcycle there. Until the cop came over, you know, I, I was perfectly happy uh, telling the manager to go fuck himself, right? <laughs> but um, but here's a cool thing. So folks are picketing. There's several hundred people picketing. I'm a little bit away. Three IWW folks with an IW flag came over, and they said, do you need us to stay here with you? And I said, I would appreciate that, right? And they stood there uh, 15 feet away from me watching to make sure nothing went weird, right? And they offered that on their own, their own solidarity. So I have an appreciation for the IW. I love what uh, they do when they're at their best. Big Bill Haywood is certainly one of the greatest American heroes that's ever lived, you know, going back to their leaders from a uh, hundred years ago. Yeah. But, uh, it's also true that the IWW is not a strong force, uh, both nationally or here in Vermont. You know, they, they just aren't. Right. They don't have any uh, workplaces where they represent anybody in Vermont. I believe they do in a few other states, but not here. So uh, what we're trying to do for the Vermont AFL-CIO is we're trying to change the culture of, of labor. Right. We're trying to make it internally more democratic. We're trying to make it more externally focused on building worker democracy. Uh, we're not afraid to be militant. We're not afraid to call a spade a spade. And we're not, and we embrace social justice unionism, right? And these are not things that are typical of the national AFL CIO. They're not typical of the labor movement that we have to this point. But it is also true that the labor movement in this country from the 1950s forward have been coming weaker and weaker and weaker. Right. And it's our belief, uh, and I could get to who we are when I say are in a minute. 
but it's our belief that by getting back to our roots, by getting back to a, a militancy and a, a true broader working class solidarity, uh, one committed to social justice, that's how we're going to rebuild the labor movement. That's how we're going to organize new shops. That's how we're going to build political power beyond the Democratic Party, which I could add is a party that has failed us every chance it's got, you know, for, for 70 years now. Yeah. So as to who we are, um, there's a, our slate in Vermont is called United. Uh, we have a 10 point program that's available on our AF, Vermont AFLCI website. And our program uh, is called a 10 point program for union power and how we want to transform our, our labor movement. And we were elected uh, to office, essentially a swept elections in 2019, swept elections again in 2020, and then swept elections again uh, in 2022. So all but one or two of our executive board, which is 19 people, which uh, is, is from our progressive slate. It's a cross section ranging from the building trades to AFSCME to members from United Academics who are part of AFT uh, to United Auto Workers, you name it, right? And we built the program leading up uh, for that 2019 election and ran an issue-based campaign saying now's the time for change. And now we've been in a process of seeking to implement our goals and our vision over the last several years. And we've made some great strides. You know, we've become more organizing centered, less lobbyist centered. Uh, we've distanced ourselves from the Democratic Party greatly. We have changed um, some of our constitutional um, protocols. We've made constitutional amendments to create more democracy internally with our organization. <laughs> And within the last few weeks, we sent two resolutions to the national AFL-CIO to be considered at our national convention in uh, June, one of which would get behind a general strike if there's a right-wing coup attempt uh, in the aftermath of the next presidential election. And the second is to change the national, national constitution to allow for the direct election of officers. Well, right now it's done by weighted votes where if my international has, you know, 100,000 members, I could have 100,000 votes. We feel that to build, if we're going to say we're going to protect democracy, right, and advance in society, we have to practice it as well. So while most of our fight is to transform the labor movement in Vermont, because that's where we could have real wins, right, and that's where we have the most influence, we also have some of our time and some of our focus put on national issues where we feel we could be a catalyst for progressive change in the rest of the labor movement. Yeah, I think it's one of the most interesting developments that I've seen in 10 years uh, to watch this process, because I've been following uh, what you guys have been doing out there. And that if, you know, anyone watching this, if you read the 10 point uh, statement, of what, what would it be your statement of principles or 10 point program, the 10 point program, it is very radical. And uh, you could see the libertarian influence up and down um is so regarding uh starbucks and amazon are those um the unions that they're trying to form are they afl cio or are they something else the amazon uh victory which was a historic major victory is independent union whether or not they affiliate in the long term, we'll see. Uh, and that's why the, the primary organizer out there you hear of, uh, uh, Mr. Smalls, who did such a phenomenal job. He did that outside of the, the regular, you know, union framework, or they did it, his, their organizing committee. And so that's awesome. Now, whether or not they get folded in or choose to affiliate down the road, different question. And I'm sure there's pros and cons to different approaches, but that's their decision to make. With the Starbucks movement, that's largely being driven um, by an SEIU uh, right. effort. And SEIU is not um, directly part of the AFL-CIO. They left some years ago to form the Change to Win Coalition. But Change to Win doesn't really exist. Uh, for, like, it doesn't really exist anymore. So there is talk about reaffiliation. And on the local levels, SEIU uh, locals can join uh, state labor councils within the AFL. We have had uh, local 200 of SEIU uh, join us, you know, and become one with us here. And I'm proud to say that as of last week, we have a majority now, right, through that effort of our first Starbucks in Vermont, which is in South Burlington. 
And so uh, as recently as a couple hours ago, the Vermont AFL-CIO, so our uh, coordinating committee, we've been having discussions of how we could support them. We've been in contact with some of those workers for the last month. They're out of majority. They filed for an election. But, you know, we're not going to win the revolution because 20 people joined the union, right? This has to be a start of something much bigger, right? Absolutely. And and this is a start and it is important and it complements the dozen other organizing drives we going on that are going on throughout Vermont right now. And that's great. And it has huge symbolic value because every single person should have the right and the ability and representation through a democratic union. Yeah, and it's also I think it's interesting because of the sector uh uh that's actually, you know, because it's the service sector. Yeah, and where Amazon is, I mean, I guess it's multiple sectors, but Mm -hmm. these are historically difficult uh, sectors of the workforce to unionize. And so I think that's, yeah, it's uh, going to be really interesting to see what happens in the next few years because of this. Totally agree. But this is an exciting time. And the polls will tell you that more Americans right now are favorable to unions and would like to be part of a union that at any time in decade in recent decades past. So there's a huge opportunity here. The question is, does the national labor movement get it right? And are they able to ride that wave? Or does the national labor movement double down on getting behind shitty Democrats that don't mm-hmm. have our interests at heart and don't do shit for us? and continue to sink in tens of millions of dollars into those election and those lobbying efforts that go exactly nowhere, right? Uh, that's that's the question. Because if you even take a fraction of that money that is wasted on the Democratic Party and put it to organizing, holy shit, we got force behind us, right? But until the National AFL-CIO is willing to send organizers to every single state to help us in our efforts, right? It, it, at the expense of, of getting rid of some of the ties that we got in Washington, you know, who have coffee with Nancy Pelosi or or whiskey with uh, Chuck Schumer, you know, until we get away from that and put the resources where it matters, uh, we're not going to be in a position to ride that that wave of interest. But but that's what we got. That is that is the argument I always make about uh, the um, the debate over working with uh, the political parties or not. I always come back to the the wasted resources that goes into trying to win the support of, uh, uh, you know, a handful of candidates for an election. And when I'm arguing with with someone about it, it's like they never even thought of that. They don't (laughs) like, and you could look up the, the, um, the numbers on what is it open secrets or something. And you could see how much has been given to each campaign and the numbers are insane. And when you think about what that money could be doing on the ground, yeah. Uh, for, for reliable organizations, it's totally. Yeah. But you think about it, you think about this, right? Politicians are never going to do what's right because they think it's right. Politicians, as an animal, as a species, right? They do what's right when they fear us. And they don't fear us when we're having coffee with them in Washington wearing suits. They fear us when we put 100,000 people in the streets. They fear us when we've gained you know, uh, significant new members nationally in the course of the last year. They fear us when people are going on strike and we withhold our labor. Our real power is in our labor and in our ability to make connections uh, and alliances within the communities where we live. That is, and they fear that more than anything. They try to keep us divided based on race, gender, uh, orientation, anything they could think to keep us divided because they know if we actually come together and put our focus on organizing, we are a force that can't be stopped. And where we have that power and where they have that fear, the politicians will follow and they will do what needs to be done or they're going to risk a revolution. That's what happened in the 1930s. And that's how we got the great social advances that came out of the New Deal. It wasn't just because, you know, FDR waved the wand and this is the right thing to do. Let's do it. They were scared of the repercussions if they didn't do those things. And that's what we got to get back to. Yeah. And they also need to. And it's uh, in comparison with the, you know, the the uh, corporations and the chamber of commerce or whatever level you're talking about, you know, there, it's not just the money that they get from them. They are afraid of those uh, capitalist interests and they need to be more afraid of us than them. Goddamn damn right. Um, so, you know, the big news right now is the leak uh, about the Supreme court 
uh, mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade. And uh, I think some unions are already talking about, you know, what's going to happen, uh, what their plan is going to be if that goes through. Is that something mm -hmm. you've been discussing at all with your <clears throat> comrades? Our, uh, the chair of our women's committee for the Romania Fosieo, uh, one of our vice presidents, Katie Stewart, just got back from Cuba last night. And so she was recovering from a, a long and tedious trip being in Havana for May Day as special guest. And so my intent was to allow her to get another day's rest. And then I was going to reach out to her to see what her thoughts are. But of course, we militantly support the right for all women to control their own bodies. Hmm. That, that is absolutely horrendous and disgusting that the Supreme Court is taking the actions they are. But that's also not surprising. This is what uh, has been happening. This is what the Republicans have been setting up for, for many years now. And this is frankly what the Democrats allowed to happen by not uh, being bold with their social agenda to allow people like Donald Trump to win electoral college elections uh, in this country, right? People don't believe in the Democrats. Uh, they get fooled with a shell game and sometimes vote Republican, and then they'll switch back. But neither of them are for us. We must militantly resist the attack women uh, women's control of their own bodies. We must stand by our sisters uh, no matter what. And I am proud to say that in Vermont, um, we are, there, there's an effort underway to provide that the woman's right to an abortion be included in our state constitution as a constitutional right. And I do believe that that will go through. So that's the reality we live in. Uh, there's a lot of fighting that still has to come, but there we are. Yep. Um, I guess just as a last uh, thing I was really curious about is just how you went, uh, how you got into labor organizing and uh, working with the with unions to begin with. I mean, <clears throat> it's not it's not a straightforward sort of thing from what I could tell. Well, my father was a union member, right? He was a member of uh, Public Employees Federation in New York, uh, and he was also uh, he was also elected uh, to a union office uh, during his career, you know, working at a state mental hospital. So I come from a union household. Uh, we didn't make tons of money, but I was able to go to a doctor. It cost us $5 to go see a doctor by the Empire plant. And we were able to have the basics taken care of in life. And that was because of my old man's union contract. So there's never been a question in my life whether or not a union's good or not, right? A union was part of our lives and made me who I am. So I carry that with me. I've been a member of the United Electrical Workers at different times. I've been a member of the Teamsters at another time. More recently, I've been a member of Ask Me, Local 2413. So, and even when I was engaged with both um, the Green Mountain and Anarchist Collective, we did tons of work in support and solidarity with, um, uh, with labor unions. That was always a core component of the work that we did. And when I was part, for the year I was part of Anti-Racist Action, 2001-2002, uh, in Columbus, I was also their delegate, their representative to Jobs with Justice while we're out there. And we did some work providing uh, striking steel workers, uh, helping uh, to collect food for their, their union pantry as part of the ARA project. So throughout all of the politics I ever done, labor has always been right there, right at the top. So it's natural, right, for me to continue my work within within organized labor. Yeah, that, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, I did have one last question. Sure. And it slipped my mind until now. Bookchin. All right. Murray Bookchin. You got you to gotta give me your spiel on Bookchin. Uh, Murray Bookchin, uh, you know, I didn't have the pleasure of knowing the man personally. One of our collective members, both in ARA and in uh, Green Mountain Anarchist Collective Lady, uh, she had the pleasure of meeting Bookchin uh, before he passed away. And he, he was an interesting man. He was a dedicated man. And a lot of his thinking was basically libertarian socialism, anarchism, mixed with a Vermont tradition of direct radical participatory democracy at the town meeting level, municipalism. And so it's really exciting to me that that way of thinking, that ideological approach has been adopted by the YPG and the YPJ uh, in northern Syria, in Rojava, Rojava today. And the Vermont AFL-CIO, it's no accident that we recognize the, their government, their autonomous government, our last convention in uh, 2021, right? 
we we stand by our brothers and sisters in Rojava. You know, we we actually sponsored a returning volunteer fighter who was a heavy machine gunner uh, in the taking of Rock Up. And uh, as a labor movement, we put him up with, uh, you know, a, a place to stay and food in, uh, in his belly for three months after he came back from fighting. Uh, we also got him a union job with the IBW installing solar panels. Uh, we have an ongoing offer to help any returning American volunteer who's fought over there side by side with the YPG and YPJ to hook them up with a union job and do what we can for them if they come back here to Vermont. So their struggle for a direct history of democracy is directly linked to our struggle for one and for more democratic uh, labor movement. It's amazing. Well, I'm going to wrap it up on that. Uh, much solidarity to you, and I'm happy to be watching everything you're doing out there. Uh, and yeah, let's keep in touch. All right. Solidarity, brother.